My name is Scott Miller. I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS. I direct the program in international business. I want to welcome all of you. Thank you for coming this morning. I want to extend my welcome to those of you watching online. Uh, in terms of how our online productions work, uh, there's an event page. You probably went to the event page at csas.org to sign up to come to the event. Uh, following for today, uh, that uh, this event is being webcast live at that events page. And then following the, the event, probably starting sometime tomorrow, uh, you'll be able to replay the event uh, at that site. In addition, a number of the topics being discussed in the case studies and some of the background of the case studies will, will have uh, uh, hypertext links uh, at, the home, at the event page, and you'll be able to find more information about many of the topics and subjects we discussed today. So uh, th thanks again to the online audience. You can follow us on Twitter at, at CSIS, and we welcome you to this discussion of innovation. Innovation is the engine toward making lives longer and better in the world. Uh, N uh, Nicholas Eberstadt, a well-known demographer, has noted that between 1900 and 2000, in that century, life expectancy at birth increased from 35 to 70 years, a remarkable bit of progress. Eberstadt also observed that during that century, well, well in 1900, the discrepancy between the richest and the poorest uh, in terms of life expectancy at birth was relatively large, and that discrepancy narrowed throughout the century. Uh, so some interesting progress, most of it due to a number of very important innovations, starting with the key public health innovations, but the kinds of things that surround us now that enhance our, our lifestyles and make our lives healthier and longer. Having said that, and, and with that bit of good news, the disparities in health outcomes still persist uh, in many issues. The advances, uh, particularly in areas of, of uh, high technology medicine uh, and, and biologics, uh, have led to treatments and cures, yet disparity in access persists. That's our subject today. Today we're going to examine the crucial role that intellectual property licensing plays in delivering inventive products and services to many of those who need it most. The program will focus on case studies uh, of these innovative methods. Uh, we have a, a, an array of presenters who I'm very excited to bring to this audience. I'm so glad they, they agreed to participate. We have a, a representative from a, uh, an agency of the U.S. government. We have someone from a public university. We have a private firm all talking about what they're doing using uh, intellectual property licensing as a, as a driver of access and, and improving the lives of customers, consumers, and patients. We also welcome in the audience the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, which beyond creating a strong uh, framework for inventors excuse me, and creators, the, the PTO encourages these kinds of inventions. They have for several years uh, had an award called Patents for Humanity. Uh, and, and two of our presenters today are, are past recipients of the USPTO's Patents for Humanities. We'll hear from them during the discussion, but I want to let you know that the, home page, that the event page will have a link to the USPTO Patents for Humanity. Uh, the application is quite simple, and for 2017, applications will be accepted through December 8th. So you still have time to get your invention nominated. Well done. In any case, thank you for being here. To begin uh, to the program, I'd like to uh, turn to our keynote speaker, Quentin Palfrey. Quentin is the co-director of the Global Access and Action, uh, which is a project of the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Quentin is also the executive director of JPAL North America, which is based at MIT. You'll find details on both those uh, inst institutions uh, in Quentin's biography. From 2009 to 2013, Quentin served in government. He was first Deputy General Counsel uh, for Strategic Initiatives at the Department of Commerce, and then a Senior Advisor at the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House. We're delighted to hear from Quentin today, who's done important research on this topic. Please join me in welcoming Quentin Palfrey. Thanks so much, John. Um, is the clicker? Uh, let me get the clicker. Well, thank you so much, Scott. I'm thrilled to be here today, um, and uh, it's great to see so many friendly faces. Um, so I want to start um, 
just with the description of uh, the challenge, um, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe I'll um, take the first slide. Thanks. Um, okay. You know, I. The oh, terrific. Thank you so much. Um, so I come at this um, from a sort of humanitarian perspective. Um, and um, so I think it's worth sort of starting with the notion. Um, that there are shameful access disparities around the world. So a child born in Cambodia today is 18 times more likely um, to die by the age of five than a child born in Iceland, for example. Um, and we've made terrific progress um, in fighting um, diseases like HIV AIDS, and yet um, 22 million people um, of the 37 million people living with HIV globally in 2014 didn't have access um, to the tremendous um, uh, advances in, um, in medicine um, that have been available to, to solve those problems. Um, and you know, some of these challenges are about cost and pricing. So to give you an example in Kuwait, um, the lowest paid government employee has to work 11 full days to, avoid, to afford sort of a seven day course of treatment for something um, as straightforward as uh, Cipro for a respiratory infection. Um, but of course, cost is not the only uh, obstacle to access, right? So many drugs, such as new cancer drugs, are not available at any price in some markets. Um, and beyond that, um, there are other more pedestrian challenges. So I spent a little time in Mozambique. Um, and if you think about Mozambique as being uh, roughly the coastline from Florida to Maine, Maputo is sort of more or less where Miami is. And from there north um, to Maine are basically dirt roads. Um, and while there are some trained healthcare workers down in the southern part of the country, um, when you get up into the northern part of the country, the ratio of trained healthcare workers to um, to people who can, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to their population is like 100,000 to one. Um, so cost is only one part of the challenge um, that we face in um, getting uh, access to life-saving medicines into the hands of people who need it, um, but it's a very important one. Um, and I'm gonna, before I get into uh, models and strategies, and in particular the role that IP licensing and non-exclusive generic licensing partnerships can play, um, I wanna sort of um, frame sort of three challenges uh, that I think that we need to keep um, simultaneously in mind as we struggle uh, with these problems. Um, and the first challenge has to do with incentives for research and development into the kinds of challenges um, that face the global poor. Um, so um, the patent system, which is our one of the uh, mechanisms for incentivizing R&D, certainly not the only one, there's public funding of, uh, of R&D and, um, uh, and and, and other kinds of systems, but the patent system does a relatively poor job of incentivizing research and development into uh, the kinds of problems that primarily affect uh, the poor, and that's because the way that the patent bargain works, um, you know, the, it works well where willingness and ability to pay are a good proxy um, for the societal value of an invention, right? So um, the idea is that we will um, give people access, um, that, that, that if you invent something that is new and useful, um, that you will invest your research uh, and your time and your money into developing that thing. And at the end of that process, there'll be an opportunity to recoup, recoup some of the costs of that invention. Um, and that works fine if at the end of that process there's some money to be gained. Um, but where um, the suffering and the harm um, that results from the problem aren't matched by an ability to pay, uh, then the patent system alone is not, uh, is, is not sufficient to incentivize that R&D. Um, second w problem, which is sometimes a little bit in tension uh, with the first problem, um, is that um, the way in which the patent system incentivizes R&D in other circumstances doesn't work particularly well 
um, for life-saving medicines. Um, so uh, the basic notion, right, is that we in the patent system allow people or allow inventors um, to um, to do something that in other contexts we think is against public policy, right? So um, in other contexts, we have antitrust laws, we have competition laws um, that say we really don't want somebody to be able to exclude others from the market. Um, but in the patent system, that's actually the mechanism by which we allow them to recoup their investment. We allow them to have market exclusivity for a period of time. Um, what that does as a matter of economics is it reduces output, it raises price. Um, that's the mechanism by which we give inventors uh, an opportunity to, um, to recoup their investment. Um, and in the context of things that are, um, are, are more uh, optional than life-saving medicines, this is a good mechanism and, and, and the trade-offs um, may work out. In the context of life-saving drugs, however, um, the people you're pricing out of the market are very, their demand is very inelastic. The dead weight loss that's created by the uh, monopoly structure um, sort of equates to life and death, right? Um, and so, um, so there are particular ways in which um, life-saving drugs um, awkwardly intersects with the mechanism that we use um, to incentivize uh, R&D in other, other kinds of contexts. Um, and then, you know, the third problem um, that I just sort of want to highlight in this space, um, which doesn't, isn't sort of a matter of economics, um, but is a sort of practical reality, is that the political climate around access to medicines tends to be highly polarized. Um, and um, there, you know, I spent a decent amount of my career in, in Washington. Um, and, um, you know, you sort of a lot of the policy discussion around access to medicines um, tends to be uh, fairly acrimonious. And to the extent um, that people talk about ideas in this space, um, they often talk about relatively big ideas um, and ideas that uh, where, where the path from um, from here to there is, is pretty challenging. Talking about ways of fundamentally reshaping the intellectual property system, um, talking about what would be possible if uh, major pieces of legislation, major treaties, large changes to the system um, were undertaken. And I think those are all important and good discussions. Um, but the, uh, the enterprise that I've spent a little bit of time working on since leaving government um, is focused on a slightly different angle on this problem, which is that I think that there are some great opportunities to identify best practices um, that um, if expanded and if worked out, um, have the possibility of saving lives, uh, and in some cases, uh, potentially quite a large number of lives, um, without necessarily um, uh, w without necessarily encountering the sets of trade-offs um, that, um, that cause the acrimony and that make um, progress uh, so difficult. Um, and in some cases, it seems like there are win-win solutions, best practices that can be expanded. Um, and it's worth spending some time um, as a sort of scholarly community and um, uh, you know, as a public policy community thinking about ways to optimize um, around practical solutions. Um, so um, I'm the co-director of a project at Harvard, uh, which we call Global Access in Action. Um, and um, we are focused on trying to develop these best practices that may have the practical result of saving lives. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about um, today comes out of a, a paper that we wrote in the Georgetown Journal of Poverty Law and Policy um, that focuses on a few of these strategies. Um, but let me sort of tell you sort of the three projects that we're working on right now. One is uh, the one we're going to talk about today, which is best practices within the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, 
that can increase access to medicines while preserving or enhancing the incentives for research and development into the next wave of innovation. A uh, second project that we're working on now, uh, we're working with a number of African uh, country governments um, and in some cases um, with some private sector partners um, in order to help um, optimize some of the laws um, and regu regulations um, that they use to make um, some of these strategies uh, more feasible. Um, and then the third uh, project is you know, sort of coming out of the Ebola crisis, learning from some of the lessons, um, uh, some of the things that didn't go as well as they might have there. Uh, we've been working um, with uh, the World Economic Forum and CEPI and the World Health Organization um, to try to think about some ways that we can uh, make the, the system of um, uh, pandemic preparedness uh, work better the next time. Um, but today, um, I want to spend uh, most of my time, the topic here is um, IP licensing. Um, and um, so I want to I talk a little bit about um, some of the strategies that we've, uh, we've talked about. I'll go into a little bit more depth on the non-exclusive generic licensing partnership, because I think it's a very interesting model, and one that actually could be expanded considerably. But let me, let me sort of, um, let me distinguish between a couple of different uh, models that people have used that I think have some pro uh, some promise. Um, so we've talked a little bit about uh, differential pricing, and let me sort of distinguish between uh, two different kinds of differential pricing. Often, um, you know, when you talk about um, a public health challenge, let's take for example HIV/AIDS. Um, uh, when you think about what pharmaceutical companies have historically done. The, the sort of traditional model, or the model that's sort of most prevalent in the market, has been to charge different prices in the poorest countries, or maybe to have some prices for the very poorest countries, and then to have a couple of tiers, um, where you sort of treat a bunch of different countries the same, um, and you, uh, you come up with a, a, a sub-Saharan Africa price, maybe there's a slightly higher price for um, some, some emerging markets, and then maybe there's a slightly higher price for, um, for, the, for the highest, uh, the most affluent markets. Um, and um, this is a process that in some ways um, increases access to medicines, right? So you wouldn't want to charge uh, in Sierra Leone the price that you charge in Belgium. Um, but uh, there is some rough justice that's associated with the cutoffs, right? Not everyone in Sub-Saharan Africa has the same um, ability to pay. Um, not all of those countries have the same circumstances. There are these cliffs between um, one level and the next. Um, and so sometimes it helps, um, but, uh, but it is not a perfectly tuned system. Um, another model and, um, has, has been to try to segment those markets um, and um, in some cases have multiple channels. So you can have a, uh, a branded drug and a generic drug or maybe you can have the uh, intellectual property holder um, work with the generic um, company. Um, and uh, you can sort of charge two different prices within the same market for the same drug. And this is a strategy I think that has a ton of promise um, and is worth exploring in, in much more detail. For example, um, the approach that Novartis took um, in intra-country differential pricing um, for its uh, malaria drugs, I think has saved a lot of lives. So we can go back to that. I want to spend uh, most of the time, though, talking about um, voluntary licensing as a mechanism. And I think that um, uh, I'm thrilled that we have some representatives from Gilead Pharmaceuticals here, um, because I think one of the best case studies in this space um, is, the, uh, is the mechanism that they uh, that they worked with in, um, in trying to figure out how to distribute AIDS drugs uh, across um, the very poorest countries. Um, so as a, as a sort of broader model, what, what, are we, what is voluntary licensing? licensing? So um, sometimes what you do is you have a, uh, you have a branded drug. In the case of, of Gilead with, with the AIDS drugs, and uh, Greg can talk about this a little bit more, they created sort of two channels of distribution. So one of the channels of distribution uh, was a branded uh, product. Um, and um, in, they had some licensees that were distributing that branded 
product. Um, but at the same time, um, the structure also allowed um, for some generic manufacturers under a licensing regime um, to sell a chemically similar uh, product under a different name um, and uh, to compete within that um, marketplace. Now, what are, the, what are some of the advantages of uh, doing a project, uh, doing a distribution me mechanism this way, as opposed to um, uh, a sort of traditional corporate social responsibility program um, or a tiered pricing model. So one of the things that um, I think is an advantage of this structure, if you can do it, from the pharmaceutical company's perspective, um, is that um, they don't necessarily have the same level of risk um, in uh, in distributing the uh, the drugs in this way, so um, they what what they do essentially is they create a a, a set of contracts um, with a, a bunch of generic um, companies, and then you know it is passed on to those companies. You don't have to run the corp corporate social responsibility program. Um, instead, you've got a marketplace um, for. Uh, for these generic companies, and they then make the decision as to whether the um, uh, whether that market is going to to work. Um, and um, and the way that um, that Gilead structured this particular program, um, there is the hypothetical possibility that they will get some uh, some some money back. So so in the in this context, um, in in very poor countries, multiple licensees were uh, were allowed to sell generic versions of these drugs at. Um, in certain low and middle income countries. Um, and then the licensees would pay the royalties back um, to the patent holder. Um, this isn't primarily, or doesn't have to be primarily, a money making uh, operation, but at least creates the possibility of scale. Um, so uh, instead of saying, look, we're going to give, we're going to donate a bunch of, of drugs in a particular geographic marketplace, um, there is at least the possibility um, that the uh, that the generic um, uh, that the generic uh, partners um, will then pay back enough money to be able to scale uh, the program. In a lot of cases, these um, these arrangements um, will have some conditions in them, um, and so you can um, say that the. Uh, that the licensees need to maintain a certain level of quality. You can um, require them um, to um, seek FDI, FDA tentative approval or, or WA pre-qualification. Pre you can um, identify um, some, uh, some supply chain uh, mechanisms to make sure that there is an arbitrage, that those drugs don't um, come back and compete um, in markets that are beyond the scope. Um, but, uh, but for the most part, um, what you're allowing others to do is to, is to distribute the drugs um, themselves. Um, so the, the, this, this mechanism can reduce the risk for the generic company. It can also um, decrease the costs um, because um, it's not the same as a donation program. Um, sustainability and scale right, is sort of baked into the process. Um, and so instead of um, sort of de determining a budget, spending your budget, and moving on, um, the, uh, the, the, pro the, um, the program can scale as far as the uh, resources will allow, as far as the market will, um, will, will, will bear. Um, there also allows for comparative advantages. So in some cases, you've got a, um, a set of challenges and structural obstacles that are faced by a branded company that may or may not be uh, characteristic of their generic partners. So the generic partners may be able to buy in bulk. Um, they may have uh, a manufacturing and distribution structure um, that's more extensive. Per, you know, a company like Gilead um, is a little bit different in its structuring from some of the other branded companies in the sense that um, you know, they, they didn't, at least at the beginning of this program, have the same kind of global footprint as some of the other branded companies. Um, but, um, but 
the, you, you can then take advantage of um, the lower costs, the bulk purchasing, and the distribution uh, mechanisms of the, uh, of the generic partners. Um, and then importantly, um, there's this notion of competition, uh, which I think um, is good for the system as a whole. And so, um, you know, in a lot of uh, other structures, um, the way that you think about pricing, right, so if a, a, a large um, IGO or a large philanthropy is buying um, drugs in bulk um, for the very poorest um, people in the world, in a lot of cases, um, what they will do is they will try to set a no profit, no loss price. Um, no profit, no loss is a very fuzzy concept, right? Because um, it's a negotiated discussion, but it's also essentially a guess um, as to what, um, you know, what, what a sort of fair price is. Um, and it's also a guess at a particular point in time. So um, if you uh, have a negotiation between a, a distributor or manufacturer and um, a philanthropy to try to pick a price for what is a fair, no profit, no loss price, if over time it becomes cheaper or could become cheaper, often there's a certain amount of stickiness to the price. One of the nice things about a, uh, a, a uh, non-exclusive um, generic licensing partnership model um, is that um, over time if the generic licensees are fighting over market share um, that will actually drive down the cost in some of those poorer markets. And what, what that has the effect of doing is meaning that the purchasers, so the philanthropic entities, the Global Fund or PEPFAR, um, can uh, purchase many, many times more drugs for the same uh, amount of money. And so one of the nice things about this structure um, is that it's potentially a win-win-win. It's a situation where um, the pharmaceutical company um, is able to run a corporate social responsibility program um, in a way that maybe um, is able to um, uh, to break even and certainly isn't sort of um, as much of a sort of net uh, money loser as, as, um, as other uh, CSR programs might be. From the perspective of some of the other philanthropic players, right, the, um, the force of competition drives down prices over time and allows um, for more purchasing power over time, allows them to make their philanthropic dollars go farther. And then um, there is the additional uh, benefit that more poor people get access to drugs. Um, so those are the advantages. Um, this is by no means a structure that will work under all circumstances. Um, but I do think it's a structure um, that is worth exploring um, whether there are um, possibilities for expansion or replication. Um, and I think that there are a couple of uh, design choices and sets of questions that are worth kind of uh, exploring. Um, the first is the scope, um, and uh, one of the obvious challenges here is um, are you talking about a, a bunch of different patents, or are you talking about a, a single patent, or at least a single patent holder? Where you're talking about um, multiple pieces of intellectual property held by multiple intellectual property owners, then there's often some value in um, a process of coordination. A patent pool is, um, is a possibility in that context where you have a bunch of different, so in the context of HIV AIDS drugs, there's often multiple pieces of IP if you're talking about um, uh, anti, um, uh, you know, uh, you're talking about a, tuber a tuberculosis cocktail. There's often a bunch of different. Um, there's often a bunch of different IP, and so it's helpful if you've got 
multiple patent holders to try to try to come up with some kind of a mechanism for taking some of the friction and some of the transaction costs around um, uh, who might be able to license and then manufacture and distribute those drugs. So that's one piece. Um, obviously, the more IP holders, the more complexity. One of our speakers will talk about the golden rice uh, example in the agricultural context. That was one where um, Syngenta held a very large percentage of uh, a, a relatively large pool of patents and created a structure um, by which um, different um, kinds of agriculture entities um, could license at different uh, different rates um, but those kinds of scope questions um, are important to, to gauge at the front end uh, another uh, challenge is market definition so the places where this model has been used most successfully um, are circumstances where you're talking about the very lowest income countries and where you're talking about um, a situation where there's philanthropic funding available. One of the biggest problems um, is that um, the countries um, where the poorest people live are often themselves poor countries. Um, and so um, for some of the same reasons that it's difficult for um, a, an innovative or branded company to make money in uh, Sierra Leone or Mozambique, um, it's also hard for generics um, to make money in those spaces. And so um, if you're going to turn over to um, a group of uh, generic uh, companies the opportunity to make money in the poorest countries, there needs to be some money to be had. And so it's tended to work the best in the set of markets where um, there is some, some donor funding. Um, the other challenge that I think um, often comes up is what about markets where um, the, there may not be a lot of potential, revenue potential for uh, the branded companies in the short term, but if you look at the sort of projections for where markets are going to come from for pharmaceutical companies over time, it's not the US and Europe, right? It's the, these emerging economies. Even some of the poorest countries are places where um, the, the pharmaceutical companies will hope to be able to make money over time. And so one of the challenges that comes up is, you know, how comfortable will branded companies be seeding a market um, that is not currently a, a, a money-making market for them, um, but may become so in time. And this is a place where I think lawyers can be helpful um, in helping to kind of define the parameters, either by time or by a set of circumstances, um, where you know one kind of a humanitarian model um, might exist uh, for a period of time, and then there might be opportunities to shift into a different model. The other market def definition problem, which is the thorniest here is that most poor people live in countries um, that uh, also have um, some wealthy people in them. And um, that becomes a real challenge in the, in the world of um, increasing access to medicines because um, it is, um, it's very hard to figure out what the right price is. If you say that the right Brazil price is the price that the very poorest people in Brazil um, can afford. Now, Brazil's a single-payer model, so maybe maybe we should talk about, um, you know, uh, uh, India or Russia, or, um, Philippines or Thailand. But you know, it's very hard to um, to say to the um, to the pharmaceutical companies you have to treat everybody as if they were the very poorest. It's very hard to say. Um, that, well, no, we're just going to sort of assume that this is uh, an affluent marketplace. We're going to charge the, the wealthier price. Um, and so some kind of, because that will price a lot of very needy people out of the market. And so some kind of market segmentation um, is, is attractive as a model there to allow for um, uh, the, the, the patent holders to make some money off of the affluent populations and at the same time to enable a, um, a distribution 
um, mechanism for humanitarian purposes. Now, there are a couple different ways to do this. One is to create um, a, an intra-country differential pricing scheme. So you can sell two different drugs, two different packages, two different brands in the same marketplace um, and try to segment the market that way. Um, and another possibility, which I haven't seen people do, but I think that you theoretically could do, um, is, to, is to allow um, some uh, generic partners to take some segment of the market um, and um, to define by contract. Um, either they get the essentially what's the Medicaid population um, or that they get um, the public health worker, uh, community health worker distribution chain or something like that. So that would be an interesting um, uh, model to see exploited. But, the, but in some ways, the poorest countries and the, um, and the most desperate disease conditions are actually the easier, the easier question for expanding this model. And in some ways, um, the middle income countries um, where there are a lot of poor people are the slightly uh, thornier questions here. Um, then let me sort of talk a little bit about um, the licensor licensee relationship because there are a lot of different ways um, to potentially do this. So the way that Gilead did it in the HIV AIDS context um, is, uh, was a model that may have worked well for them and could probably work for some other um, uh, companies, um, which is there essentially was a group or is a group of uh, generic companies um, who are contractually um, have a contractual relationship with the um, with the patent holder, um, but essentially sort of operate independently. And you need to do, you know, in, in that kind of a structure, you obviously need some kind of technology transfer. You've got to work with the generic. Um, folks to make sure that they know how to uh, make the drug and, and make it safe. And you've got to do some work uh, to make sure that you're protecting the supply chains, making sure that there is, um, uh, you know, that counterfeit drugs aren't working their way um, into the hands of, and this is one of the, the great challenges um, in sub-Saharan Africa and other parts of the world. And you need to make sure that, you know, you, you, that, that the drugs that are uh, distributed in the poorest countries don't sort of show up in the other countries. Um, but that's not the only model that's possible here. So another um, possible model, if, um, if for various reasons um, uh, drug companies are not as comfortable um, working with a group of, uh, of generic licensees, um, you can actually create um, a, an exclusive uh, relationship with a particular uh, distributor, um, but still get the opportunities uh, to scale and build out those partnerships. One of the shortcomings, though, of that kind of an approach um, is that you may not have competition driving down the prices in the way that I've described. But for a larger um, branded company that does have a global manufacturing distribution um, uh, structure, that may be an attractive opportunity. Um, so let me just sort of mention a couple of the obstacles um, to this model and sort of think about ways that we might sort of overcome some of those. So one of the challenges I think that we face or that someone would face in sort of thinking this through is one that I mentioned already, which is sort of this notion that um, a market that a company doesn't, um, doesn't have any prospect of making money in now may not always remain so. Right, and so I think one of the things that um, you know I'm not in those sort of boardrooms, but I can imagine um, that one of the challenges, if you say, look, you know, let's do this, let's let's allow uh, some some generic companies um, to sell uh, these drugs in in this you know in these 90 or 100 countries, um, and if they make any money, they give us a cut. Um, you know, one of the challenges I think you run into is, okay, well that's fine. We didn't have any plan. Um, to sell those drugs in, in Mozambique uh, in the next uh, few years, and we're not going to make any money off of it anyway. Um, but I'm not sure that that's the case in 10 or 15 years, right? And so trying to figure out how you might, um, uh, might de-risk that um, for the companies um, might go a long way um, to, uh, to advancing the replication of this model. 
Um, and, you know, I mean, there, there, another challenge, right, is, is the technology transfer aspect of this. So um, in some cases, I think that there is both sort of cultural resistance within the pharmaceutical industry and also uh, practical challenges um, to sharing the information that um, exists um, about how to make uh, this work and you have to build trust and you have to uh, you have to build up those those structures um, and um, so there's a certain amount of investment um, both sort of literal investment and sort of uh, emotional and cultural investment that I think you would have to make to, to sort of expand um, this model um, I want to spend just a moment though on um, sort of other ways of building a more collaborative environment. So this is a model, the one that we've been talking about in terms of non-exclusive generic licensing partnerships, um, is a model that involves um, sharing IP. And I think sharing IP is a really important um, opportunity for expanding access uh, to medicines. But it's not the only um, thing that companies could do more of that would help us both increase access to medicines and um, improve the environment for research and development of drugs that primarily, or vaccines or therapeutics that, that primarily affect the poor. And one of the places where I think that companies could do a lot more um, without um, necessarily undermining their structure or uh, their corporate culture or radically changing the environment is to share um, research better. Um, so here, uh, so I, you know, as I mentioned, I spent some time in government, um, worked uh, in the Commerce Department in the Office of Science and Technology Policy and thought a little bit about, um, you know, reforming the patent system and, and the incentives for innovation. And one of the things that sort of I've learned over time about innovation is that innovation is a little bit of a messy thing, right? Some of the best ideas um, don't sort of come out of a linear path. So you, you all know the story of the post-it note. So the post-it, I love this example, the post-it note, you know, a bunch of people at 3M, they were trying to develop a good glue, um, and somebody figured out how to develop a really crappy glue, and it was sort of on the, you know, it was on the cutting room floor, and somebody, you know, um, uh, you know, said, well, actually, here's a great application for a crappy glue, and it, you know, developed into a, uh, a relatively, you know, large money-making operation. A slightly more sort of risque example they like to use is Viagra. Um, you know, that developed out of a, a stream of research that was um, focused on, on cardiovascular challenges, and in studying that, uh, another mechanism of action, another uh, therapeutic um, effect was discovered and that made made a lot of money but in the in the context of um, trying to figure out how we solve the next Ebola how we how we uh, develop a malaria vaccine how we um, how, how we how we think about the sets of challenges that primarily affect uh, the global poor and for which there are not there's not enough uh, sort of incentives for for innovation one of the things we can do is work together better, right? So there are mechanisms for this. Um, there, one of them is called WIPO Research. It's a great um, project of trying to create sort of central clearing houses uh, for, uh, for research that may have applications. Um, you know, the Patents for Humanity program, which is a terrific program, I hope that people will consider applying. Um, uh, one of the recent uh, awardees of that was uh, Novartis uh, work. Um, into these indolocarbonides, which is um, part of the um, solution to sort of uh, drug-resistant um, tuberculosis, um, they uh, had this stream of research that they developed, um, and at a certain point in the development of that research, they decided that they weren't going to take it forward, and instead of sort of locking it away in some vault, they gave it to the TB Alliance and said, you know, here we haven't done the uh, we haven't done the you know safety and efficacy and the clinical trials and that's very expensive but you know here it is and this is part of the research that you can use at a certain point in the Ebola 
um, outbreak in West Africa a few years ago, you know, there was sort of this moment where a bunch of the drug companies that had been thinking about this stuff sort of came together and said, okay, now we're going to kind of share our research. Um, and that was very helpful in terms of accelerating um, the, uh, the conversation, but it does sort of beg the question, why wasn't that kind of collaboration happening with respect to those uh, those challenges beforehand, and some of it, right, maybe is that there was money to be had, and you know these are the, these are uh, important, you know, proprietary streams of research. But but some but some of it is just cultural inertia, right? They're sort of at the back of you know there there's some hypothetical possibility that this stuff might be beneficial uh, or profitable in the future, and so the, there's sort of institutional resistance um, for, to getting together and, and and sharing that research, and there may be times uh, where that makes sense, right? Um, and there may even be signs where that's better uh, for innovation, for there to be races. But I do challenge uh, us all to think about whether there are streams of research um, that we could share um, that would allow for greater uh, collaboration around, uh, around these challenges. Um, and whether lawyers um, and other sort of public policy professionals are thinking about how to advance corporate social responsibility in this space uh, might de-risk some of that collaboration, right? Are there not, are there, um, you know, uh, non-disclosure agreements that we can uh, help negotiate, or there are ways that we can um, sort of make it safer for um, innovative companies to sort of uh, put some of their research in. Because, you know, one of the great sort of challenges that we face, so take the Ebola example again for a moment, um, you know, a lot of the research that went into the thing that is likely to sort of emerge as the most effective vaccine for Ebola was already sort of out there in the public domain years before the outbreak. There was a published article in Nature. There was a, uh, a vaccine that um, had a good um, safety and efficacy profile. Um, and um, it didn't get those clinical trials, and it wasn't ready. Um, when the outbreak came, and part of that um, is because our system isn't necessarily set up to identify those uh, vaccine candidates and to funnel uh, research dollars into um, those kinds of challenges um, in a sort of optimized way. Now, it may be, right, that, you know, those philanthropic dollars were going into malaria or, or, or uh, neglected tropical diseases, but also maybe that um, we can do a better job of working together, of thinking about what we know collectively, and of uh, optimizing both the CSR uh, the corporate social responsibility efforts, the philanthropic efforts, the international governmental efforts, and making our sort of scarce dollars invested into these resources uh, go far farther for, for, for poor people. Um, so before, before, I, before I end and, and bring up the panel, I want to mention, um, so the project that I helped run at Harvard as part of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, and we always, um, you know, we, we always like to think about uh, technology and the role that technology plays here. And I think that it's important to kind of think about what might be right around the corner and how that might affect some of these questions. Um, so I'll mention a couple. Um, one is in the area of uh, supply chain management. Um, this is, uh, you know, a sort of even by the standards of this conversation, a somewhat wonky question that has dramatic impact on people's lives. So um, in Africa, one of the great sort of public policy challenges in the drug space is that there are a lot of uh, compounds out there that are neither safe nor effective. Um, now, in some cases, there those are compounds that are uh, IP violations, but actually the same compound and probably have a public health impact that's sort of positive, at least in the very narrow sense. Um, but a lot of these are just not the right thing, and people take the drug and pay for the drug and think that they're going to get better, um, and they don't, and they die, and this is a big problem. So there are a couple of things um, that uh, have the potential to be quite helpful in that space. Um, there are uh, M-Pedigree and Sproxyl and a couple of other uh, mechanisms that allow you to um, 
uh, do supply chain management with a barcode and a cell phone, and those are, uh, those are very interesting models, a little bit expensive, but very interesting models. But, but, but increasingly, there's also the possibility of using uh, miniature spectrometers, and these are really cool. Um, this is a really cool possibility to put into the hands of public health workers um, uh, handheld devices that allow you to detect the chemical composition of the drugs in the field um, and identify whether those are, uh, those are actually the uh, chemical uh, compounds that are going to um, be effective for the patients. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to work with some African governments um, to see if we can roll out in, in, in some context. The other one I want to mention, and this, this goes to the, um, the sort of IP licensing question and, and also to differential pricing, is um, what about 3D printing, right? So to, to what extent um, does the emergence of the possibility of 3D printing as a mechanism for uh, producing at least some kinds of therapeutics um, uh, allow for um, sort of creative thinking? And also, what are the kinds of challenges that that will create? So one possibility, right, is that it could disrupt um, some of these manufacturing and distribution um, chains. Um, that could be good, that could be bad, it will probably be both, but you could imagine going back to my Mozambique example, um, that, you know, I, so I went and I talked to some of the people in the CDC and they said the biggest problem we have is that the, the packages um, that the drugs are in are too big and they don't fit in the trucks, right? And you know, like this is a stupid example, like stupid in the you know in, in the in the very narrow sense. But like real people live or die because the darn package doesn't fit in the truck. If you can develop um, more lightweight um, distribution mechanisms, manufacturing mechanisms, that could enable and telemedicine as well could enable um, a distribution system that works well. But also imagine what this could do for pricing, right? So you know. Um, is this, uh, does this allow um, for opportunities to segment markets, to, um, to charge people on the basis of what they, uh, they actually can afford to pay? Um, or alternatively, does it create challenges to uh, innovation because uh, it, it facilitates um, IP theft in the ways that, um, uh, that, uh, that electronic distribution of, of music um, enabled? Um, and so I think that there's lots of ways in which we need to not only kind of think about how can we work within the system of manufacturing distribution and pricing that exists today, but also think about how um, the manufacturing distribution of tomorrow might play on uh, how we do pricing, how we do, um, uh, how we do licensing. So thank you. We're going to have a brief set change here while we remove the podium. Quinn is going to stay with us up here as a discussant, but also for questions at the end. Let me invite the panel to join me. I have so many questions that I don't get to ask, but <laughs> I'm delighted to turn to, to this part of the program. I'm uh, do, pleased to be joined uh, by three panelists, uh, very different backgrounds, very different issues, all around the theme of licensing to improve uh, uh, the public's health and well-being. Uh, we'll start with uh, the, the, pro the public university uh, approach. K uh, Dr. Carol Mimura is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Intellectual Property and Industrial Research Alliance, Industry Research Alliances, IPIRA, at the University of California, Berkeley. She established this office in 2004, runs it today, flew in from California to join us, so we're delighted to have you. Uh, but uh, people forget what a, what a research powerhouse the University of California is. 
Uh, I think it's the only place on planet Earth that has a parking lot that can only be used by Nobel Prize winners. <laughs> and it's busy, <laughs> okay, so it's a remarkable place. Carol has the access to this, uh, what, the university is basically a non-practicing entity as a patent lawyer would talk about it, but she has access to this and, and put together a program that uses these inventions in a really fascinating way. Uh, second, we'll hear from Greg Alton. Greg is, the, sorry for the fast scene change and losing the second half of the, my apologies. Greg Alden is Executive Vice President, uh, Corporate Medical Affairs at Gilead Sciences. You've already heard about Gilead's uh, work in HIV uh, antiretrovirals this morning from Quentin. Uh, Greg will talk further about how this policy uh, of, of uh, voluntary licensing arrangements to reach patients outside their normal market areas is, is working and how it's being applied to some of their new, uh, newly developed treatments. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Robert Bertram. Rob is Chief Scientist at USAID's Bureau for Food Security, where he leads the, uh, and is a senior advisor on a range of technical program issues regarding global security and uh, food security and nutrition, uh, mostly in the program uh, Feed the Future. And, and Rob has uh, sort of the downstream applications know-how uh, of a number of these licensing arrangements, including Golden Rice, the patent pool mentioned earlier. So we'll hear from each of our panelists, and then we'll turn to the audience for questions. Carol, oh, one, one uh, microphone etiquette before we start. When you're done, turn it off, the red button. Uh, that will prevent feedback for the, our online audience. Thank you. Carol. Thanks very much for the opportunity to be here today. I had a little moment of panic this morning because I came in to the hotel across the street in the dark, and then when I woke up, I opened the curtains and the huge University of California logo is staring me in the oh, face. <laughs> but didn't I just spend six hours on a plane? <laughs> so fortunately, for the first time, was able to see the University of California DC office, and it's always a pleasure to come to Washington. So about 2002, 2003, um, Eva Harris, a professor at UC Berkeley who was a MacArthur Genius Award winner for her work in Nicaragua, came um, to the office and she actually approached me and she said she was almost afraid to make this request. She thought um, we wouldn't give her the time of day, it was a radical idea. But she was working on a MEMS-based, a microelectromechanical systems-based handheld device to detect dengue fever at that time for applications only in Nicaragua. And she said, a driving force in my life has been to take scientific good and make it available to developing countries. In other words, to use science to make the world a better place. And this is a sentiment that is shared by many, many professors at Berkeley and in our local innovation ecosystem. So she wanted us to patent her device and give her startup company, the Sustainable Sciences Institute, a free license. And um, the Sustainable Sciences Institute's mission is to support scientific and public health communities in research poor settings to develop sustainable local research and public health systems. Um, and immediately we said, um, okay, so you want us to patent something and license it to you so you can deploy this in Nicaragua. You started the conversation by saying, I, Eva, uh, by saying that you realize that the university uh, owns the patent and you have to deal with us in order to do something for public good needs in Central America. Are you asking us not to patent? She said, no, in this case, I'm asking you to get a patent and give the Sustainable Sciences Institute a free license because um, others can do this and there are many copycats out there. This device is very, um, is very technologically sophisticated and someone else can get a patent that's very close to what we're doing and block us. So we need to use the patent system in this instance. So um, she didn't think that her request would fit with what universities traditionally do, but we had just reorganized the office to approach IP licensing and IP management from a holistic standpoint for the campus. We were highly motivated to increase the number of companies that we 
did business with at the time, about 100. By the way, we're doing business with over 1,350 companies now. We were also motivated to find different ways of working with industry, not just IP licensing, not just sponsored research, but also industry affiliation. Uh, companies also give us gifts. They work with us in many, many ways. In fact, sometimes someone from a company will come to Berkeley and will say, do you know, you've done these 12 things with us. You know, if we put Intel in the middle, did you know that you, know, you hire our professors as consultants, this, that, and the other thing? And um, invariably, they'll say, no, I had no idea. You know, I didn't know what all of the other uni units were doing with Berkeley. So in this reorganization, we were also organized and motivated to maximize the public benefit of research and development from IP, not just to maximize royalties from patents. Of course, we're also required to do that because we're self-funded, but um, there can be other metrics. So we were excited about the idea and we put a humanitarian licensing program around it. By that, I mean we developed specific clauses for technologies that could and should be deployed in low and middle income countries or in low resource settings. And um, we simply said, you know, there can be a bucket for this type of deployment and a bucket for that type of deployment, but what will the contracts look like? We have to create a repository of terms and a repository of deal terms, uh, deal terms and business models. So within the next two years, a couple of additional opportunities presented themselves to us. Um, Jay Kiesling, the pioneer of synthetic biology, brought two deals to us, one pertaining to an antiviral compound from the mamala tree that is um, a tropical tree indigenous to Samoa and elsewhere, and then um, a project pertaining to uh, making um, semi-synthetic artemisinin from artemisinic acid in yeast. Um, I don't know if you picked up the brochure, but some of these case studies are shown here. Um, so those two projects quickly followed on the heels of the Sustainable Science in Institute project. And because the um, malaria project uh, brought in $42.6 million from the Gates Foundation to a three-party partnership at the time, consisting of the Institute for One World Health, UC Berkeley, and Jay Kiesling's startup company, Amorous Biotechnologies. It, it got a lot of press, and people were very interested in figuring out, well, can I do something um, similar with my technologies? And it really got the ball rolling. So we always say that Eva Harris provided the moral compass, but then some early deals put the meat on the bones and gave us an incentive for more momentum. Also in the brochure, you'll see that there are um, deals in other areas such as agricultural technology, uh, biotechnology, sanitation, diagnostics, and research tools. And so the issue here, though, is that IP licensing is always difficult when we have technologies invented by the university because they're so early stage, normally because they're federally funded. So we'll approach a company and say, are you interested in commercializing this patent? Only to hear most of the time, we don't know, it's so early stage. I mean, you do have a publishable um, outcome here, but it's very far from being a commercial product or service. So we realized that um, we're facing in these situations um, market failure. These are situations where um, a product that's based on university research in developing countries um, are in countries where patients cannot pay or they cannot pay a fair price which doesn't result in an incentive to companies. So the challenge for all of these deals, I think there are maybe eight or nine described here, has always been how to provide enough of an incentive for a company to invest in the expensive research and development that it takes to take bench science into the marketplace and how to adjust the risk-reward balance, um, and then also how to help the frontline negotiator show, show the corporate board you know, what's in it for us. If we make this investment and we help the university to deploy this technology in low and middle income countries, um, you know, how can we um, convince the company to, to make a go um, decision? So in all of the case studies, the solution has been partnering. 
It involves working with public-private partnerships or creating public-private partnerships or working with product development partnerships. So we're doing this to de-risk the R&D portion of product development to catalyze ultimate commercial uptake. And we have to make sure that we all have a return on investment, the nonprofits and the for-profits. So um, in the other handout, you have, um, you see these deal structures, IP management strategies and business models being described as Euclidean innovation because we show the university as the oval and the US government as the square and uh, as a pentagon. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it does have a um, meaning. <laughs> yes. yes, the pentagon perhaps should have been the, the uh, government. We'll <laughs> but in all cases, we're simply showing you know, how the rights flow, how do the IP rights flow, how, do the, how does the money flow, how do the reports flow, how does the data flow, and how you put these deal structures together left to right in a time frame, who enters first, who stays until the bitter end, who exits, and how they exit. Um, so, because when it comes to neglected disease and under-resourced populations, again, where there's no par profit driver, market economics are not operating, and so this lack of commercial incentive required to justify investment has to be balanced with other forms of return on investment. So each deal meets our goals, and each deal meets the other participants' goals. And um, we're trying to promote widespread availability of technology in the developing world at affordable prices. We are requiring companies to sell the product at cost or to give it away for free in the target countries. Um, but price is a market economy factor, and these contracts are addressing non-market economy needs. So in these uh, agreements, although one on the second page of your handout, the TB diagnostic, isn't a traditional license. Uh, we donated four TB patents to a pool under a Creative Commons open license. This was done right at the beginning um, of the era when the FDA said, well, let's see if we can change the risk-reward balance by offering um, a priority review voucher to any company that commercializes um, a drug in for uh, the treatment of a neglected tropical disease. These vouchers are extremely valuable. They're worth hundreds of million dollars, and they're also transferable. They can be licensed or um, monetized and they can be used to accelerate the approval of another drug of choice through the FDA. So um, the, let's see, in these agreements, um, we're the IP owner, we're the licensor, but we don't collect royalties on sales in the target countries, and we are requiring, as I said, uh, price restrictions on the licensees that ultimately provide goods and services to the target populations. So interestingly, um, with 22 deals, no, have been, no two have been identical, but they have some elements in common. And um, through these partnerships, we are describing, um, in, again, in that Euclidean um, description, uh, various ways of providing incentives. But in each case, every partnership is defining who the parties are, whether they're for-profit or non-profit. Some are for-profit companies acting for a time as a non-profit under a non-profit strategies. Um, how are the, um, all of the rights transferred? How are the data uh, transferred, collected, confidentiality? How are tangible materials needed for these research projects exchanged and how are they managed? Um, what are the specific milestones for each partnership? Um, which milestones are distinct or which milestones are required by to be accomplished by two participants? How is it financed? How many types of financing? Um, how many and what kinds of contracts are needed? How are the results ultimately delivered and put to use? And in all of these, we are showing that um, the real question for all of us is 
how to innovate on the innovation process itself. You know, how can we maximize collaboration for a given scenario, let's just say, a low cost water treatment, so that um, we learn how to collaborate well in the sandbox and not get into fights and do what we need to do to share resources until we all go home happy. Um, and not just changing the culture of innovation, but changing the culture of collaboration. Because as Quentin said, innovation isn't linear. It's, it has many switchbacks and U-turns and dead ends. Um, on our website, we also show you the, um, some of the specific legal clauses that we use in contracts, both in license agreements and in research agreements. Because often before we have a license to give to any entity, we're contracting in a research program with the goal of having IP that will, deploy, will be deployed under this program. And in many cases, the licensees want to help those in um, resource poor countries, but they expect and they need to make a profit where um, we have normal market economics operating. And um, they are not always contracting through their units of corporate responsibility. I think that's all I should say for now. But, uh. Thank you, Carol. Oops, sorry. Uh, Greg. Okay. Um, thank you, <clears throat> and I apologize. I'm, I'm struggling through a uh, gift my children brought home from school. So, uh, <laughs> but I want to thank you, Scott, and CSIS for hosting this event and having Gilead. It's also great to be next to Carol because I'm a graduate from Berkeley. So hey. proud of all the work you guys are doing there. Um, so this is a great panel for us because at Gilead, two things that we're very, very focused on are is obviously innovation and then access to innovation. Um, in terms of innovation, and a lot of this has been touched on, and so I won't spend a lot of time talking about intellectual property, but we could not do what we do without intellectual property. We would not have received the initial investments in Gilead to start the company and do the research that we did in HIV early on without intellectual property. Um, and we could not continue to invest our shareholders' money into uh, technologies without intellectual property as well. So it is, it is, it is really a foundation of everything we do. But we also do recognize at the same time we're, we're very successful in diseases like HIV and viral hepatitis. These are diseases that have very big, you know, commercially viable traditional markets in the US and Europe, but also have a dis disproportionate impact on poor people around the world. So it creates a, you know, a, a bit of a, a challenge for us. But um, it is something we've been very, very focused on. And, and over the last 30 years, we've been very, very successful in transforming HIV. We're, we now have single tablet regimens where people can take one pill day and actually live a pretty normal life and normal lifespan in viral hepatitis and hep C we've we've uh, come up with huge breakthroughs to cure hepatitis C in over 90 percent of the population as well as hepatitis B but the challenge that we've always had is is how do you how do you balance the, the the commercial needs of a company like Gilead and then the access needs of poor people around the world and Quentin t touched on a lot of this so I'm going to tell this more in, in, in the terms of a, <clears throat> a story we launched our first HIV product in 2001 um, literally, the, maybe it was the day after, but within the same week of that, our, our then CEO, John Martin, who used to run research for us, came to me and said, you've got to figure out how to get these, this, this HIV product into places like Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and remember, this is 2001, so this is like right after the, 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 uh, the South African litigation. It was a really tough period of time, and there was really no proven model to do this. And we, we struggled, and, and in about 2003, we launched our first version of our access program. And it had a lot of the components that Quentin talked about in terms of intercompany differential pricing. We had we tiered pricing um, with with no profits up to our highest profit mar uh, markets, um, and we launched our access program that way. So, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we provided our products at at a no profit price, and then we had different tiers. Um, by 2006, um, it wasn't working at all. I mean, it absolutely was completely a non-start. I think we were reaching about 20,000 people of the, you know, 40 million who needed the needed the product, and so we <clears throat> obviously, you know. We, because we really were, we did want to provide access, we sort of took a step back. What could we be doing differently? Um, and we sort of looked at, well, who's doing a good job? And we looked at the com competitors out there. So we looked at the traditional big pharmas and didn't seem that anyone else was really doing anything that was remarkably successful. But the companies that were doing a really good job were the Indian generic companies. So we said, we said wow, well, why don't we do what they're doing? Well, we're not built to do what they do. So then, the, then you know, as, as, as Carol talked about, you, you work in partnership. So we decided, why not partner with the Indian companies and have them actually work with us and actually manufacture our products and distribute them 
um, into into the least uh, developed countries of the world. So that was sort of the thought thought experiment. We went through a lot of the um, thoughts that you know Quentin went through. Well, what about product diversion? What about product quality? And all these other issues. And we really determined that that probably was not going to be a problem for us based on the research that we've done. So um, in 2006, we um, launched our, our, our licensing program. And as Quentin you know, described, we, we decided it has to be multiple companies. It ha we need them competing on price. And the idea is that we'd have a high volume, um, low margin business, but they would compete on price and bring those prices down. And what we've seen over the last um, 13 years, I guess, since we launched this, um, well, I guess about 10 years since we launched our HIV um, licensing program is um, just tremendous reduction in price, about an 80% price reduction. And then in terms of volumes, we went from that 30,000 today to about 10 million people are receiving the medic medication on, on a daily basis. So it's phenomenally successful. Um, we now have added um, hepatitis C into this program as well as well as hepatitis B. Um, and that's working extremely well. We're, we're, we now believe we've cured about six million, um, six, 600,000 people for hepatitis C. A lot more work to do, but we continue to, to, to improve upon that. So we're, we're looking at ways to um, work with governments, work on some of the things that, that Quinn talked about in terms of intra-country um, differentiation um, uh, with, with, our, with our medicine. So um, we continue that. Um, so we also, um, um, in 2011, were the first company to join the medicines patent pool. Quentin talked about the, 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 the value of a, of a patent pool. Um, one of the big values for us is, is just getting more companies to contribute their, their intellectual property into um, this type of a licensing program so that you can come up with more combinations, whether it's for HIV or for hepatitis or eventually other diseases. Um, our licensing programs actually do allow any combination um, for the products. The other thing that, that <clears throat> has been um, really, really um, successful successful for us in this licensing program is we collect about a 5% royalty. We're able to take that royalty and then drive medical education programs, regulatory work we do in the countries, pharmacovigilance, and, and um, it's, we're not making money, but we're not losing money. It's very sustainable. Um, and again, that, that investment has been very helpful to us because it's, it's, it's not enough just to get a product that we believe is a great product. Um, you have to go in and actually educate on it. You have to talk about the difference between the, uh, the next generation breakthrough versus um, some of the older products. So we do a lot of that as well. Um, looking forward, we want to, we're going to continue doing this with, with um, we have new HIV products in the, in the pipeline. We'll be launching another product next year, so we continue to innovate. Um, this is already, um, in, we're well, negotiating right now with all of our licensed partners and MPP to include this product. All of our hepatitis C products are now in, the, in this licensing program. We actually just recently announced that we're expanding our licensing program to include uh, five new countries, uh, Malaysia, Belarus, Ukraine, and Thailand and Philippines uh, in our licensing. So we, we continue to adopt and, and improve upon this. Um, and it's been quite successful. Um, I, have a, I have a short video. Um, uh, with, with your permission, Scott, I'd like to play the video and just describe a little more. Um, and then I'll just answer questions at the end that people may have. Thank you. should have access to our life-saving medicines, regardless of where they live or their economic means. This includes the farmer in Tanzania, the banker in Boston, and the teacher in Rio de Janeiro. Access Operations and Emerging Markets is a dedicated business unit within Gilead, focused on making our medicines available to patients in more than 130 countries. Gilead has established a two-pronged approach that provides sustainable access to both our branded and licensed generic medicines. For our branded medicines, we partner with leading companies in each country that assist Gilead in navigating complex requirements such as regulatory submissions and health system strengthening. We then look at gross national income per capita and disease burden to establish pricing. This tiered pricing approach divides countries into low income, lower middle income and upper middle income tiers. Gilead is able to make our medicines available at even lower prices through innovative partnerships with generic drug manufacturers. We provide timely technology transfer so that generic versions of our medicines are available in low income countries where the need is greatest. The majority of our generic medicines are produced in India where companies have a proven track record of producing high volume, high quality, low cost products. Licensed generic manufacturers are free to set their own pricing within the licensed territory. 
The aim is to spur competition amongst manufacturers, thereby lowering prices. Thanks to our generic licensing partners, the number of patients on Gilead HIV AIDS medicine in developing countries has grown exponentially, from 30,000 in 2006 to over 10 million a decade later, and those numbers continue to grow. The final element of our approach is a focus on public health and strengthening health systems. Many countries are faced with weak health systems, poor education, supply chain obstacles, and a lack of political will. Gilead works with governments, NGOs, and healthcare providers to address these issues. Thank you, Greg. <clears throat> yeah, actually, I'm glad you started in 2001 with your description because it reminds us all how far we've come in a short period of time. I have a strong uh, memory of the initial difficulties with HIV AIDS drugs. And uh, uh, my friend, I had a friend who was the communications director at Pharma. And I remember the South African lawsuit was filed. And in the docket, it was entitled Pharma v. Nelson Mandela. And so I called my friend in the communications shop. And I said, why did you sue Nelson Mandela? And he paused for a moment. He said, because Mother Teresa was dead. <laughs> so it was just the, the absolutely ugliest PR problem you could have. Okay, and treating almost no patients. Okay, now here, 17, 16 years later, you have a magnificent number of people who are actually getting healthier, which is a, which is a great testament, and it's important not to forget the past. So, with, uh, but thank you, Greg. Uh, Rob. Thank you, Scott, and good morning, everybody. Well, I think by now it's pretty clear how much research, innovation, and technology contribute to outcomes in the developing countries, having listened to my fellow speakers here. And of course, this is also very true in food security. And agriculture is almost by definition dependent on technology change, in part because pests and diseases and other things that affect yields and profitability are also evolving and changing. Um, I think within Feed the Future, the US government's uh, global food security initiative that Scott mentioned at the outset, and particularly uh, at USAID, I think the guiding principle to our investment strategy is that we leverage and apply the uh, best available science to solving problems faced by particularly smallholder farmers in the developing world. So it's very gratifying to be part of this because this is obviously a theme that cuts across sectors. Um, I want to point out that we are demand driven in as much as we set the agenda around our research partnerships in ways that uh, reflect what our partner countries are telling us their problems are, what approaches they wish to pursue. So I think this is not, this is not a supply-driven agenda, although we certainly try to keep our eye on the innovations and new advances that are occurring. Um, we also respond to market failure. Um, the lack of def effective demand has already been discussed, and that's certainly true for innovations in agriculture, just as it is in health. Um, another thing we deal with is the very high exclusionary costs in some parts of agriculture. If you're thinking of a self-pollinated crop where farmers save the seed, the opportunity to recoup uh, that investment from a private investor is, is limited. So, so we have to think about getting past both those um, uh, uh, obstacles. Um, we also, somebody mentioned orphan diseases, I think it was Carol. Uh, we also think about, or maybe it was you, we also think about uh, orphan crops. So we know, for example, in our country, we take for granted all the investments of USDA and the private sector in all kinds of familiar crops. But what about cassava? What about um, sweet potato? What about uh, uh, some of the legumes that are critically important to food security and nutrition in the partner countries that we're working with in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, so what we've seen over the last decades, really, is that more and more the technologies we want to be able to access to bring to bear on this effort to eradicate undernutrition and eradicate extreme poverty have become increasingly proprietary. That doesn't always just mean private sector. That can mean public sector, but protected. Um, so we need innovative approaches that at once reflect those legal frameworks in the countries in which we work, but also 
find ways to bring this innovation to bear. And fortunately, as we've heard this morning, many of the people who own these technologies or have rights to them are very excited to be part of this kind of solution seeking and developing responses. This is very true in biotechnology. Uh, it's also, though, this advancement in terms of science and proprietary dimensions has been paralleled, in a sense, by changes in the regulatory framework. So we have things like the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, the Nogoya Protocol, and so forth, which have uh, affected uh, access to genetic diversity. Which in agriculture, genetic diversity of crops and livestock, these are, these are the building blocks of the new technologies we need to develop. So we've, we're, we've become con, you know, uh, uh, habituated to things like prior informed consent, uh, uh, mutually agreed terms of access and benefit sharing. And the agricultural community in particular has tried to move forward in ways that reflect those larger agreements but also speak to some of the opportunities and needs in the agricultural sector where generally speaking one stands to gain more by sharing diversity rather than ring fencing it. So that's, uh, that's one of the ways that uh, uh, we it's, it's, we stand out and it's an opportunity, but it's also a challenge of how do you message that in a, in a, 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 a world that thinks about national sovereignty. Um, so we've worked alongside USDA and the State Department and other agencies to try to protect the interests of farmers, including American farmers, but the world's farmers, in terms of being able to continue to access this diversity, which is the building block and the underpinning of the innovation process and gives us the tools we need to deploy against diseases, pests, and increasingly abiotic stress, heat, salt, drought tolerance, things that are being already experienced in parts of the world much worse than we're experiencing them, but they're big problems here as well. Um, so uh, innova innovation then re ultimately depends on connecting the um, that, that diversity to application, and we take a, a variety of approaches with the goal being really trying to get technologies into the hands of farmers, easy access by the farmers. But we have to respect, as I said, the laws of the countries where we work. And there are many different things we have to consider. Patents, PVP, plant variety protection, licensing, very important, the contractual aspects of the kinds of uh, uh, agreements we're involved with. And they, these rights generally cover make, use, and sell. But they often have geographic dimensions, and we've heard about some of those this morning. Uh, and, and they can have economic segmentation, which has also been mentioned around, say, farm size, or the in income of the farmer that, that is the target beneficiary. So a key message from my colleagues when I talked to them about coming today, Scott, was figure this all out first. You know, don't do all the work and then say, oh, what about, you know, our freedom to operate? So, um, so let's talk about some examples. Scott mentioned uh, golden rice. This was the effort, came out of European scientists, German and Swiss, to put pro-vitamin A into rice as a, an effort to really fight against vitamin A deficiency and the worst aspects thereof, things like uh, night blindness and such, uh, blindness in general. And um, so that partnership is uh, with the International Rice Research Institute uh, and Syngenta, and it involves Bangladesh, Philippines, uh, and uh, in terms of the donor support, it is uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation working with us, and also with Helen Keller International, whose mission in life has been eradication of vitamin A deficiency. So it's, um, it, it was something where the, there was a public donation of the IP to a, con a company, Syngenta, which then improved it and helped with the stewardship of it in a way that had a, a segmented approach geographically and then within geography, farmers making less than $10,000 per year. Now that seemed like a great idea in 2001. As we're getting very close to getting this technology into the market in countries like Bangladesh and the Philippines and elsewhere, that may not be such a good idea in some ways because if we're really trying to scale this there might it might be more effective to get some larger farmers growing it such that more of the product was available at a competitive price to the intended beneficiaries which is, is the poor so sometimes you know you almost have to you may want to go back and 
say, hey, let's talk about you know what we agreed 16 years ago and maybe uh, a, another approach is appropriate. And that's, that doesn't happen in just that example, but this idea of going back to the licensor and the owner is something that we do. Um, my colleagues suggested we be careful the term humanitarian use. Not that there's anything wrong with it, we're involved with it, but you have to define it all the time because it's a moving target, it means different things to different people. So again, it needs to be clarified in each case-by-case -case basis. Another thing we're in, encountering now is we'd like to stack traits for iron and zinc in with that vitamin A, make a really nutritious rice, because iron deficiency anemia is hugely contiguous with rice consumption and production in Asia. Well, you've got to go back to the owner of the technology and say, can we do this? So, so this is a, it, you really need to have sort of an ongoing relationship. It's not getting it once and then, and then just moving on. So maintaining freedom to operate was a key message from our partners, that they, this is an ongoing responsibility that they feel and that is essential to really achieving the ultimate and maximal and optimal impacts of the investments. Quentin mentioned uh, differential pricing. We did a, a, a partnership with Monsanto and Mexico. that's a big seed company in India, uh, using a bifurcated pathway. So it was two different outcome groups, one through the public sector, and this was to develop eggplant that was resistant to fruit and shoot borer, which is a huge pest. And eggplant is the most important vegetable, and it's very nutritious, most important vegetable in South Asia. It's sprayed 70, 80 times per growing season because the pest pr pressure is so high. So by bringing in the BT gene, there was an opportunity to have a much more envir environmentally friendly food safety uh, uh, and a greater availability at an affordable price of this nutritious food. It's now been released in um, Bangladesh. 5,000 farmers or probably more are growing it. Um, it's look being also partnered within the Indian context and in uh, Philippines. But and, and the farmers love it, consumers love it, uh, but again, it's this idea that the bifurcated part was, one part was for OPVs, open pollinated varieties for smallholders, the other part was with companies going to commercial hybrids for large scale growers who could afford to pay for hybrid seed. So that was a, a, an approach there. Um, on water efficient maize for Africa, this is a partnership with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and USAID, and uh, the CIMIT, the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, one of the CGIAR centers associated with the Green Revolution. Six national programs in Africa and something called the African Agricultural Technology Foundation based in Nairobi. That was set up years ago to fill in a gap around stewardship, to get these technologies into pro-poor environments. But some of these technologies require very knowledge intensive, skill intensive, development and stewardship. So that's what AATF does. Um, the key points here, and this echoes one of the points that was made, I think, by Greg, the commercial seed companies um, will not, they won't pay a, a royalty to the IP holder. In other words, that's, that's Monsanto, that's actually AATF, excuse me, Monsanto licensed the trait uh, for a BT and also for the drought tolerance trait to AATF. So the companies, the seed companies that are partnering in Africa and the national partners won't pay a royalty, but they will compete among themselves. So I think this was analogous to what you were talking about with generics and your sub-licensing there. So part of what you want here is not to make this all about a humanitarian venture, but to build in, in this case, a, a culture of investing, innovation, putting the, the, the traits into the best background possible, competing with, because with, it's not just the traits, it's, it's a little different from the drugs, it's the whole uh, 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 seed and uh, growth. And by the way, um, USAID was particularly important in bringing in the BT into this drought tolerant maize partnership. And I think many of you know the stories of the effects of drought in sub-Saharan Africa and how devastating it can be. We have a new threat there, fall armyworm. Some of you may have heard about it. It's an introduced pest from the Americas. Well, this technology has very great promise for, um, for uh, responding to that threat. Um, uh, one more example, uh, cowpea, a self-pollinated crop, no commercial interest, but we were able to leverage in a partnership where we went to an Australian lab and said, 
we need to be able to figure out how to bring pest resistance into this crop for which there is no genetic transformation. That lab developed that. And then again, the, 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 the trait was licensed to the same group in Africa. It was given to the Australian lab to integrate. They had to patent it there because in Australia to protect it as, an, as sort of a defensive patenting measure. But then it was, it was given on a non-assert basis by Monsanto. So there, as long as it's the patent is followed and copied, they will not assert any um, uh, rights over it across all of sub-Saharan Africa. So another innovative approach to, to leverage in proprietary technologies. We've got a couple more examples, but I think, I, I know you want to have time for uh, Q&A um, as, as well, Scott. Uh, a few last points then. Um, so we also work in the area of animal diseases. We heard about orphan diseases. We're working with Rift Valley Fever. This came out of Department of Defense investment here in the US. University of Texas El Paso modified that to make a more effective vaccine for livestock. This is a zoonotic disease. It can go from livestock to people. And we're now, that the University of Texas at El Paso is now partnering with a Moroccan vaccine maker to multiply the vaccine and get it Again, it's that ability to be able to get high quality product at scale. A lot of the countries where this is a problem, that doesn't exist. So this is a way to get an, another developing country. And so we are also looking at South-South business innovation partnerships in that. Um, a few last points. Stewardship is a huge challenge and remains so. A lot of these technologies are knowledge intensive, things like refugia and such, and having, how, how to manage them in the field. Um, we're very excited about the south-south dimensions, but we're already running into obstacles where there's geographic licensing in Africa, but not in Asia, or vice versa, and yet the technologies could be relevant in both. So that's, again, back to the drawing board in terms of talking to your partners and figuring out if you can expand the scope of the license. Um, and finally, um, oh, the, the whole ca regulatory capacity building and science-based regulatory and biosafety approaches. We have a whole other arm of our investments that give these technology, these countries the ability to make their own informed, wise decisions about what technologies they choose, how they manage and steward them in their own environment. So again, it's really about their ownership, not ours. And finally, I just want to say to all of you that as somebody that works on the development scene in agriculture, the United States and USAID are uniquely positioned to be able to do these kinds of science-based investments. A lot of other donors, I'm not including the Gates Foundation, but a lot of bilateral donors can't touch them because of the politics or this, the sensitivities about biotechnology or even private sector partnerships sometimes have been sensitive. I think that's changing. But, but the, we, we also think about freedom to operate in the context of as, as a development investor and partner. Sure. Thanks, Scott. Thank you, Rob. Uh, as, but right before we open to questions for, from the audience, I'd like to turn to Quentin. And uh, first, to get any comment you might have. But second, if you could talk about <clears throat> the art of balancing incentives and making sure the incentive, because what each presenter mentioned in the panel here was the importance that the only way to get to scale on these things is to ensure the incentives are managed correctly, but the difficulty of doing that is immense, as Carol's uh, deep contracts would show. Uh, so, Gwen, can you talk about that, and then anything else you want as well? Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott, and thank you to all three of you. That was those were terrific presentations. So, um, one of the things that I find most interesting about this topic is that it's an area where um, sort of it's both an intellectual challenge and uh, something with immense um, sort of real world consequences. So. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in here is which pieces of this puzzle are solvable by smart, well-meaning people um, in ways that allows us, if we're sort of smart in the scholarly world, if people are smart in the corporate social responsibility world or in the industry, um, or uh, across the you know across the spectrum of stakeholders where we can actually fix things. So one of the things that I think I would love to hear, and this goes to your question, Scott, a little bit about the balance between incentives 
incentives and, um, and access, um, which I don't think are in conflict, but you have to sort of puzzle through a little bit, is you know, what are the obstacles to expanding on some of these best practices that are fixable by uh, pro bono attorneys, by scholars, by sort of smart social cor corporate responsibility or corporate people within industry? So for instance, are there ways that we can make non-disclosure agreements um, more effective so that there can be more sharing? Are there ways that we can um, tackle things like supply chain management or um, arbitrage or reference pricing in ways that sort of um, identify and address legitimate challenges within corporate culture to expanding on models that, if done right, um, could lead to win-win-win scenarios. So I guess my question um, sort of to the panel is, you know, what are the fixable problems um, that get in the way of us sort of doing more of what I think ultimately could both um, sort of allow us to incentivize the investment and um, you know, get people access to the things they need right away. Valeria example, um, we had partnered with Gates Foundation funding with a nonprofit and a for-profit, the Institute for One World Health and Amaris Biotechnologies. We didn't know that in the future the pharmaceutical company that would sell, um, ultimately sell Artemis, Artemis and in combination therapies based on synthetic <laughs> semi-synthetic um, artemisinin would be Sanofi Aventis. Not knowing that in advance, you know, the, the problem was how, how do you tell the Gates Foundation, our goal is to reduce the existing price of the drug from $2.50 to $0.25, cents, and this is how we'll do it without knowing who will take that up. But the value proposition was if we de-risk this, because no, no pharmaceutical company will sign up to serve 88 countries for free today, but if we give them the strains that overproduce this and, and um, one more thing, then maybe they can see enough value in it. But the other pharmaceutical companies, interestingly, said somebody has got to s solve this problem of having, let's just say, a pan-African regulatory system. Because if we go to the trouble in um, Burkina Faso or um, Niger or Nigeria, we why do we have to spend as much as we would you know, in a developed world country? Um, just the prospect of that is not even allowing me to put this before the board. Can I, can I take a shot at this? <laughs> um, I agree with what Carol said about the regulatory. That's, that is a big challenge. The, the amount of work that, and investment has to go into the regulatory process. But I want to just a couple things. That, there's no one, one solution to everything. <clears throat> one thing that we see is a big problem, you, you touched this, this, Quentin, in your presentation on the ciprofloxin, is procurement um, at a country level. So our example that's similar to the ciprofloxin is our products that we sell through our licensed partners, one of them is Viriad. It's for HIV, it's also for hepatitis B. For Viriad, it's procured through Global Fund um, primarily, but also through, you know, in South Africa, there's, there's tendering and they, and they get the very, very lowest prices. If you use that same product for hepatitis B, it can cost 10 to 20 times as much. Um, in the same country. So there's a huge problem with procurement of how we're procuring our generics, and there should be a way to pool that. And I think one example people should look at is PAHO. I think they're doing actually a very good job right now in terms of um, the, the pull mechanism that they have, and I think that could be modeled in a number of other markets. Another one um, that you mentioned, I just want to just touch on a little bit, is, is reference pricing. Reference pricing, um, it's, it sounds like the right thing to do, but it actually hurts poor countries, because you've got poor country that's referenced by wealthy country, so if, if you price, low and poor country, you have to price low and wealthy country. Yeah. That's a real problem. People should call that out for what it is. It's, 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 it's hurting poor countries around the world. Um, and the other one, um, Quentin, and we, we spoke about this, is, um, how is how to deal with poor people in middle-income countries. Because I think you're absolutely right. Really, really poor countries are easy because we can say we're not, we're not going to make any money there. We'll allow you know, whether it's generic product or, or no profit products. But when you get into middle income countries where you have a very sizable GNI per capita, but it's skewed among a very small wealthy population and then a large poor population, it does create a challenge that you, you talked about. And there's really, 
there's two basic solutions to that. It's either a single payer system within the country where they pool their money together and they have a reasonable price that covers the entire population, which, you know, for example, in, in many European countries you have, or you can, or systems where you can have intra-country pricing. And um, I actually, there, there's only, there's very few examples of intra-country pricing, but China actually, as many, many people may know, has an HIV program within China that actually, um, we have that product that's sold for hepatitis B and for HIV. For HIV, we provide it at the lowest possible price um, into China. Our partner, GSK, sells it at a higher price for hepatitis B. It works because they've created this very contained channel within China for this um, very needy HIV population. I'd also say the United States. We have tiered pricing within the United States. We, you know, for, and take HIV as an, an example. We have extremely low prices for the Ryan White program, for the for the ADAP program. We have a, we have much lower prices for Medicaid, and then the private prices are higher. We're able to do that because of the way the systems are set up. So governments could set up intra country systems that I think would be very attractive to our industry where we could you know have higher prices for wealthy people and then a system for you know a a a, a poor a poor population so a lot of what I mentioned and perhaps what others have mentioned this morning um, reflects sort of efforts innovation innovative ways to try to get technology to people who need them uh, and responds to market failure. I mean, at the end of the day, what you'd like to see is for market failure to go away. I mean, you'd like to be able to see uh, the ability of uh, low-income people to still express their uh, demands in ways that would respond. And then you'd also want to see a, a pro-innovation regulatory and legal environment in, in countries. And often that's missing. I mean, a lot of the countries we work in, there isn't much in the way of uh, any protection. So a lot of what we do at the policy side is to try, uh, and this is apropos, for example, of improved seed varieties and such, to get regional harmonization of, of regulatory uh, uh, structures in place. Or So if you release in two countries, you, it can be released in all 16 that belong to that regional economic community, this kind of thing. So in other words, to try to to, 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 to make the economies of scale more reachable for investors, particularly private investors, but also potentially public investors. Um, there's plenty of public, fu publicly funded innovations that aren't getting where they need to go because the systems aren't in place. So, so that would be the regulatory piece of that, the, or the, 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 the legal framework, policy framework. And then I think the other is, you know, to see slowly a transformation that increasingly allows farmers to both access markets but also benefit from those markets in terms of inputs and outputs. So improved seeds, uh, other, other kinds of technologies uh, that, that, they, that they need. So uh, really it's about trying to strengthen that over time and in the meantime looking for opportunities that help foster that sort of innovation relationship where people are thinking about not just saving their seed year after year, but they're aware that there's some new opportunities. If they find that seed and grow it, they'll do better. And, and so same sort of thing on the animal side as well. Uh, thanks. Let me now turn to the audience. Oops. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Carol. And also, can we have some legal research more than we can find now on a Google search about the way lawyers uh, construe or governments, um, the difference between pro-competitive and anti-competitive behavior. Because <laughs> we'll get to a point in a discussion inevitably with a company where the, we're talking to the business development people and they'll say, the first thing that the legal department at the company said is, isn't this an antitrust issue? Are you setting a price? <laughs> yeah, but we're setting it at zero. Isn't that pro-competitive? And they said, still, yeah, price yeah, fixing and yeah, is a, anti-competitive and um, just certain things about the program. We can't ultimately set a price for a company. We're so upstream in the value chain, but we're trying to motivate the lowest price for the poorest. So in that area, can we at least advance the discussion? You know, can, can great law schools, you know, have a, give it to us some students to research. We need more in that area. And then also in the ag area, the programs we have experience with are with su super sorghum for Africa and with um, pesticide-free solanacea, such as, uh, such as uh, peppers and tomatoes. 
And um, at a certain point in the discussions with companies and foundations and other universities, people were saying, well, isn't the best thing to do to put all the traits in a pool? And two of the companies said, um, as you said, um, stewardship often involves knowledge sharing. But they said, if you were truly to do that and put it all into the commons, the trait would be destroyed, as traits would be mismanaged and destroyed or kicked out of the background uh, germplasm. So there is a role for proprietary rights and licensing and, and stewardship so that everything isn't diluted, because we do want disease resistance and um, drought tolerance and not necessarily with um, genetic, uh, with um, the GMO approach. Oh. Thanks. I'd like to turn to the audience now, I'm sorry, <clears throat> uh, before we run out of time. Uh, I have two questions there. We, we'll come, come to you a second. Please wait for the microphone uh, so the online audience can hear your question. Second, let us know your name and affiliation. And third, Make sure your question's in the form of the question. So, and if it's to a, a specific panelist, you can do that too. So, a woman here, yes. Hi, my name is Claire Wingfield. I'm with PATH, um, and I think you've referenced some of PATH examples in, in these conversations. So we've done a lot of these things. We actually have set price caps, um, a maximum price that can be charged, and continue to negotiate those prices. Um, so I would love to hear the, the panel talk a little bit more about the sustainability, because you can negotiate IP and, and get an agreement, but how do you make sure that those agreements are stuck to? So for instance, PATH, we, we do a number of things where we're negotiating access throughout the development process, but also once it's gone to scale and actually put, you know, 10, 15 year timelines on some of that. So I'd love to hear from, from the panel about that. And just a quick note to tell you on regulatory, there is an African medicines agency that has actually been launched and the African medicine regulatory harmonization efforts are doing quite a bit on regional harmonization. So it's slow going, but uh, that, there, that is happening. So on the um, requirement to sell a given product in a target geography at cost or give it away for free, we will relax that requirement if the licensor in that territory gives another license or non-exclusively licenses their IP plus our IP such that there are more than at least so that there are two or more companies out there serving that target market. So we still don't say what the um, new price will be, but um, we are addressing, we're trying to link the original obligation to a motivation to um, create competition in the marketplace. Well, one thing that, <clears throat> that we've done in, in um, both HIV and viral hepatitis is we also, we do have multiple companies that we license to, and we as, they are um, very competitive. So we, we have, you know, 10, 11 Indian companies, and believe me, nobody competes like these Indian companies. They are, <laughs> and that was, that was actually one of the reasons we really initially tried to stay away from local manufacturing, because we didn't want to have a, a company maybe favored by a government, although we do allow some local manufacturing now. But the other thing we do is we actually launch our own product, and we launch it at um, either a no profit price or a low profit price, which creates a price ceiling. So, for example, in hepatitis C, we launched at you know, roughly $300 per bottle for the product. So that created a cap that they would start out, and then it, that, that price would go down from there. But it does create a discipline, and it does work because we've seen in, in markets where a generic went to market first, oftentimes the price was much higher than we would actually set our cap, and then once we come in, it would come back down. The center aisle. Thank you. Uh, Neeraj Mistry, I'm at Georgetown and an international health uh, consultant. Um, I used to be at the Global Business Coalition when a lot of these policies started, so quite familiar with them. Uh, my question is more downstream, and I think it certainly builds on uh, uh, things that Greg has been talking about. Uh, the, the big worry is um, uh, timing and the transaction costs for each of these negotiations. Each company, each time a new product comes on, we have to go through this. And so it's one thing to have the technology, but by the time there's diffusion of it, it's a long drawn out process with huge transaction costs. And, and I wondered if there's a, a, a possibly a collaborative policy framework that we can look at. And I think Greg alluded to criteria they look at uh, HNI and burden of disease. But um, there's quite a few of us who believe that they aren't poor countries anymore, but poor people 
in all countries. So the intra-country pricing is going to be important. So looking at modeling, particularly with a sensitivity analysis on Gini coefficient or inequalities in country, uh, investment from foreign governments, market potential or royalty revenue or diffusion of innovations, can we have a plug and play type of model to see if the conditions are right for a particular type of licensing that accelerates access uh, uh, to, to many of these products in a sustainable way for companies as well as investors? So I think this is a great question. I agree with you that, um, that the intra-country uh, issues are going to be increasingly significant, um, both in terms of the access and in terms of the sustainability of the access. Um, my colleague at Harvard Law School, um, Mark Wu, spent a little bit of time sort of giving a little bit of thought to this sort of typology of what are the sets of circumstances, and what are the kinds of countries, what are the kinds of regulatory systems that may be um, to appropriate for various models, um, but I do think that this is an area where we, you know, the scholarly community and the pro bono sort of legal community could do some more work to get us 90% of the way there for a particular set of negotiations so that there's something to play with and to build off of and to sort of take some of the friction out of those negotiations. Because I don't think you're going to be able to do it all the way down to the specific details, but I think that if we could have a little bit of a typology and some sort of, um, some, some uh, some sort of model uh, kinds of documents and, and, and structures. It's just, it's, it, but that would be a great project for uh, some, some lawyers and, and some scholars to, to sort of take on. Is there a question up front here? Or? Yes, right here. Well, I have two questions. Let's get them, do a little lightning round. We'll get both questions, and then the panel can answer both. So. Good morning. My name is Day One. I'm a, I'm a research intern at the Manchester Street. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. It was really fascinating. I was wondering that as these technologies are used in the uh, LMNC, I wonder how does uh, is there uh, what kind uh, what does the uh, how does the culture play a role in this IP licensing? Because uh, as the as the as she deal with the as the, is deal with the people in the low middle income countries, there may be of different attitude from the developed country so I wonder are there any challenges because of the because of the different attitude toward the o towards the ownership of this challenge uh, towards the ownership of this IP thank you thank you let's get the second question here thank you oh stand Hi, uh, my name is Meredith Basie. I'm from Universities Allied for Essential Medicine. Uh, this is a question for Carol. Um, I know that in 2012, the University of California system adopted global access licensing provisions to ensure that any new medical innovation technology would be affordable and accessible in low and middle income countries. But I was wondering if you were aware that the same system is now being urged to drop its patent rights in India on uh, a prostate cancer drug, Extandi, that was developed uh, within the system and is priced out of reach for the majority of patients in, in India. Thanks. OK, specific question for Carol, general question for the panel on culture and the licensing. Well, uh, as a university owner of IP rights and a licensor of those rights, we can't dictate the ultimate price of a product, and um, we can't um, prevent a licensee from telling us where they want us to perfect rights. But we can insert clauses into the license agreements um, pertaining to um, sub-licensing of those rights, or we can retain the right to um, license a third party in the charitable uh, field under humanitarian uh, licensing principles. So um, a licensee um, not serving every market um, can be taken to task by the licensor through these clauses to address you know, who will and how another company or even an NGO or a nonprofit will address patients in that given uh, country. I think they were not policies to their guidelines, licensing guidelines, but um, I can't speak to the specifics. We manage um, UC Berkeley's patents in my office. Thank you. Any comments on the question of culture and licensing? Go ahead, Bob. Rob. So I think 
people are used to paying for medicines, but I don't mean to minimize my colleagues on the health side, but we do deal with culture, um, more so in, uh, well, in two areas, in the, the, the framing agreements at the global level. I mean, they, they, we've gone from a world that thought everything belonged to everybody, all biodiversity, you know, was a common heritage of mankind, I remember that phrase. And we've gone to a whole different extreme of that. But the problem is that if we're trying to drive innovation, and we, this plays out in our own country, if there's no way a company can recoup, recoup investment, it will be left to the public sector. And if the public sector can do it, great. But in many parts of the world, that doesn't quite happen. So we do try to, you know, one does try to have to respect the cultural perspectives that any farmer should be able to grow any seed she has. In other words, if, save her seed year to year and, 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 and yet that may not in the longer term be f for a particular crop with particular kinds of uh, characteristics, that may not be the most effective way to try to get that innovation to scale or to offer opportunities for investors. So com countries have to feel their way through legally, but then the global community has an ongoing debate about, well, what's the right balance between um, this idea of you know, providing some exclusion for investment on the one hand, but access on the other. Well, thank you. Before we conclude, I want to recognize the fact we have two colleagues from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office here and uh, give them a chance to make an intervention if, you, if either of you want to. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I just, we're here from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office because we wanted to let you all know about um, an opportunity you have to uh, apply for Patents for Humanity. Now, that it dovetails very much with what the entire panel has said here. As a matter of fact, Two of the panelists, Dr. Carol Mamura and Greg Alton, are their institutions are recipients of Patents for Humanity for their work respectively on malaria and AIDS. Patents for Humanity is the United States Patent and Trademarks Office's premier award for patented and licensed technologies that actually address humanitarian issues, including medicine, nutrition, sanitation, household energy, and standards of living. Uh, it's very easy to apply for this, and you've got to do it before December 8th, so please do this now at uspto.gov slash patents for humanity, one word. And what winners get is public recognition for their work with the imprimatur of the USPTO, plus a certificate to accelerate certain examination processes, so you can wind up getting your patent faster, or re-examination processes. I am not a patent attorney, so I have more capability and I'm more qualified to tell you what it is than to tell you how that works. But again, you can find that uh, information at the website and you may have noticed that there are brochures um, at the table for Patents for Humanity. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Quentin Palfrey was the originator for this and uh, of Patents for Humanity and I think he deserves a round of applause for that. So uh, thank you. That's all the time that we needed on that. So. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for attending. Please join me in thanking our panelists and speakers.